Aloha and a very warm welcome to all of you, our participants. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. This is the second of six webinars that we'll be introducing and sharing highlights of the 2022 statistical report for the Hawaii State Plan for a Data-Driven System of Care on Substance Use. My name is Devaro Talangi and I will be your facilitator for this webinar. Before we get started with our presentation, I would like to give a few housekeeping reminders. First, this is a Zoom webinar event, which means that you, our audience, are able to see us, the panelists, but we cannot see you. There are two ways to interact with us and between yourselves. The first is through the chat window, which you should be able to see on the Zoom status bar. And the second is through the questions and answers window, which you should also be able to access through the Zoom status bar. We encourage you to post questions and comments, as well as to introduce yourselves, as it will help to make the webinar more interactive and add to the discussion. Our panel and team will try to answer your questions as they arise. However, we also do have time allocated for discussion, so our panel may try to answer questions at that time. There will be four poll questions that will be posted throughout the presentation. There is also a short post webinar survey at the end that will pop up when you leave the zoom room. Your feedback is very important for improving the webinar series, so please consider spending a minute or two to fill out the survey. Finally, we will be providing the slide deck with all of the supplementary material, contact information and links to all our participants after the webinar. A recording of this presentation will also be available next week. The recording for webinar one, which we had last week, is now available online and the link will be provided as well after the webinar. Okay, so now I will go ahead and introduce our panel. Our first panelist is John Valera from the Hawaii Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. John is the Acting Administrator of the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division and in that role is the sponsor for the State Plan Project. He has served at the ADAD in various capacities since 2016 and is a Certified Planner with the American Institute of Certified Planners. He has a Master's in Urban Planning from the University of Hawaii and a Bachelor of Science in Planning and Public Administration from the University of Southern California. Our second panelist is Dr. Jared Uro, also from the Hawaii Department of Health, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. Jared has a Doctor of Psychology degree from the United States International University. He completed his Master's in Education at Columbia University and received his Master's in Psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology, San Diego. He is a licensed psychologist and since 2002, he has worked for the Hawaii Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division where he serves as chief clinical officer, clinical psychologist, supervisor, and currently as acting public health program manager. Our third panelist is Dr. Gerald Bush from the John A. Burns School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry, where he is an associate professor of psychiatry and associate director of addiction psychiatry. Jerry is board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. He received his doctorate in medicine from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School and his Master of Public Health degree from George Washington University. Jerry is a subject matter expert and lead author of the Systems of Care chapter of the State Plan Project, focused on substance use and mental health. That chapter is titled Establishing a System of Care for Severe and Refractory Dual Disorder in the State of Hawaii. Our fourth panelist is Heather Lusk, who is the Executive Director of the Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center. Heather received her Master of Social Work from the Hawaii Pacific University. Heather has over 25 years of experience dedicated to reducing health disparities and stigma as it relates to HIV, viral hepatitis, and other chronic conditions linked to substance use. Heather is the Chair of the Hawaii Advisory Commission on Drugs and Controlled Substances and Vice Chair of Partners in Care, Oahu's Homeless Coalition. She is a subject matter expert and lead author of the System of Care chapter of the State Plan Project focused on substance use and homelessness titled Housing First, the Effectiveness of Harm Reduction at the Intersection of Substance Use 
and homelessness systems of care. Welcome to our panelists. Again, my name is Devro Talangi. You can call me Dev, and I am your facilitator for today. I am an assistant researcher at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, co-principal investigator of the Data Infrastructure Core of the State Plan Project and lead author of the 2022 Statistical Report. This presentation is separated into two main parts. First, our panelists will walk you through highlights from chapter four of the report, looking at substance use and mental health, followed by a short discussion. Then our panelists will walk through the highlights for chapter five of the report, looking at substance use and homelessness. Again, this will be followed by a short discussion. Please post any questions you have in the chat for our panelists to answer. And we do also encourage you to post your own answers and comments on the discussion issues. Since we only have one hour for each of our webinars, our goal for this webinar series is to introduce and highlight some of the findings from the report. If you are interested in viewing the current draft version of the full report, a link and the password is now being provided to you in the chat window. Please note that since this draft is still in the consultation process, it is a view only version and is not available for download. Alternatively, you can also view the highlights provided in this webinar either in an interactive or infographic format at the Hawaii Behavioral Health Dashboard. That link is also being provided to you right now in the chat window. So before we move on to the chapter highlights, I wanted to give a few brief comments about the data sources that are being used for the report. We had a few questions and comments about this last week, and I don't want to spend too long on this, but I thought a um, short overview would be useful. Firstly, there are 18 data sources that were used for this iteration of the report. They fall into these three general categories. However, some of them do have aspects that belong in multiple categories. Each type has its own pros and cons, but the main thing we were looking for is data can be validated either from the source or by us through our own methodology. Some of the data sets that are used throughout all the chapters of the report include um, the NUSDA, the National Survey of Drug Use and Health, uh, the HCUP hospitalization data, and the Web Infrastructure for Treatment Services, also known as WITS. These 18 data sources were determined to be the best available data sources which we had access to up until the current draft was finalized in January or February of this year. Given the size of the report with 300 or so tables, we had to make a decision on a cutoff date for the current tables as we do try to vet all the tables that we include to ensure the validity of the information provided in the report. Many of these data sources you see here are available publicly, but some are only available due to the partners who graciously gave us access to their data. We are aware that there are other data sources which may provide more comprehensive and newer data, but unfortunately, due to various reasons, we do not necessarily have access to that data. Some of these include the all payer claims data set, which is currently still in development and not yet ready for wider use. There is also the Lolima Hospital data, which is the successor to the HCAP hospital data that we use in this report. In saying all that, the reproducible analytics framework that was built to produce this current iteration of the report will allow us to make updates to the report with fairly minimal effort as the data becomes available in the future. Aside from the value of having an updated picture of substance use in the state after 10 plus years with this latest iteration, I do think there is significant value in the reproducible framework for future updates to the report. If you would like to know more about the methodology that was employed to produce this report, please refer to the report itself. Chapter one of the report covers much of what I just said in greater detail. If you would like to know more about some of the limitations of each data set, the appendix in that report outlines this information for every data set, along with links to further references. I will attempt to outline some of these as we go through the sources for each chapter. Okay, now we will move on to the highlights for chapter four, which again is focused on substance use and mental health. So we have our first poll question, um, and this question should be popping up on your screen uh, right about now. Um, this question is, how familiar are you with mental health issues in the state? 
I will give you a few moments uh, to provide your answer. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now move on to our second poll question. Uh, that poll question is, are you directly involved with providing mental health services? This is a single yes or no answer. Uh, again, I'll give you a few moments um, to provide um, your input. Great. So now we will move on to the overview of chapter four before I hand it over to John to take us through the highlights. So this chapter is split into three subsections. The first section is looking at the overall landscape and intersection between substance health, between substance, sorry, between substance use, abuse, uh, and, and dependence. The primary data set that is used for this section is the NUSDA data set which is a large and comprehensive national survey conducted by SAMHSA. The great thing about the NUSA is that it is publicly available, it's very comprehensive, and it has been conducted over several years, which means its methods have been refined quite a bit. The downsides are that surveys of this size and complexity do have trouble with getting a large enough sample size, especially for smaller states like Hawaii. One of the ways that we got around that was to take pool averages of either two, four, or six years rather than looking at individual years. While individual years data availability is usually okay for the more general indicators, we do run into problems of cell suppression when looking at specific indicators. And we decided that having a more consistent approach for comparisons was a high priority. The next section looks at emergency visits and hospitalizations. We examined individual visits to the hospital that were recorded as having both substance use and mental health as primary or secondary diagnosis. We had two separate data sets for this, although they belong to the same larger age cup family. The data set contains very comprehensive record level data from all the hospitals in the state, with the exception of two, which are military, I believe. The downside again is that this particular age uh, cup data set only goes up to 2014. The last section in this chapter looks at treatment, and again, we have the NUSA data set as well as the TEDS admission data set. The TEDS is a national data set that is publicly available and it compiles data from treatment facilities that receive public funding. Like many clinical data sets, the TEDS reports instances of admission and discharges and does not track individuals. The TEDS data, like many national data sets, lags by a few years. In this case, the most recent data is from 2019, which got released in the fourth quarter of last year. This next slide outlines some of which I just went over, but again, if you want more detailed information about each data set, please refer to the appendix of the report itself. Okay, so now I will be passing it to John to go over our highlights. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Dev, for going through the, uh, introducing the different data sets that were covered. Um, so we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm gonna try to be brief. Uh, this slide is, again, not to suggest that this is a comprehensive overview, it is it's more of a, just to give you a taste, so that if you were to look at the, uh, specific subject matter chapters as well as the overall statistical chapter, um, to, uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, this slide uh, suggests uh, it's from the National Survey from Drug Use, Drug Use and Health. Um, it surveys uh, problems with uh, emotions over the past 12 months. Um, the survey question was during the last 12 months, did you have any problems with emotions, nerves, or mental health that you probably caused 
or made worse by use of substances. And so um, notice that the, uh, that the Hawaii, there are several bars like methamphetamines, pain relievers, uh, cocaine, marijuana, where Hawaii is higher than the national average. And so that's something worth noting. Next slide, please. This is part of a uh, module within the NISDA, National Survey of Drug Use, Drug Use and Health, that was designed to give, provide data on different mental health measures for adults 18 and over. And so um, the bolded, you can see the bolded categories, uh, any mental illness or AMI plus drug alcohol dependence or abuse and MMI, mild to moderate mental illness plus the alcohol, drug and alcohol abuse or dependence abuse and represent areas where the percentages were higher for Hawaii than the United States. Okay, next slide. Okay, this is from uh, an older hospital data set called Healthcare Cost and Utilization Project, HCUP. Um, the, the change was made around 10 years ago, as Dev uh, mentioned. It only goes up to 2014. So it'll be interesting if, you know, if, if uh, the current hospital data sets are comparable to, to this to establish any sort of trend. Um, but uh, it focuses on ER visits. It shows a primary diagnosis as any mental health condition, whereas a secondary diagnosis is substance. And you can see alcohol, amphetamines, and tobacco are uh, um, pretty prevalent. So these bolded categories are substance, are substance related secondary diagnoses that were the most common among ER visits with primary diagnoses related to mental health. Okay, next slide. Okay, this focuses on inpatient visits, same hospital data set. It shows primary diagnosis is any, any mental health condition, secondary diagnosis is substance use. Again, uh, the bolded categories show that you know, which substances are the secondary diagnosis, diagnoses that were most common. In this case, alcohol, cannabis, and tobacco. Again, it'll be interesting to see how this data plays out compared to more recent data sets, uh, if both the HCUP and what's available currently could be compared. Um, so again, Looking at tables like this, while it may answer a few questions, it does beg more questions, leading to further discussion. Thus, uh, our desire to engage with you all and the community. Next. Okay, so this is from the TEDS data set. Again, this measures admissions and discharges which doesn't necessarily correlate to number of clients served because a client could have multiple admissions or multiple discharges, you know, depending upon um, uh, how it's recorded, um, especially if, if they were, uh, I know in, in, in the days before Hawaii Cares, um, there, there tended to be, uh, we, we, we saw some preliminary data that shows that while there, while many clients did have, you know, fewer than three admissions in a given time period, um, uh, there were a small subset that had multiple admissions, which suggests that these clients were kind of, you know, taking upon themselves to uh, visit one provider after another and thus getting readmitted multiple times, you know. Um, so 
which kind of led to our um, to, to the formation of white care so that we, we could reduce that administrative burden on the client seeking to get help. So that all, all they have to do is call one number and then the um, call center, referral center could uh, link them quickly to a provider who's conveniently located close to the client. Uh, my observation from this um, is that the numbers appear to be low compared to what some of our providers are seeing in the field. So, you know, for example, I, I've, I hear the anecdotal, I hear anecdotally one facility reports over 60% of their clients um, incoming have co-occurring disorders. So it's tables like this that you know, it's the reason why we're having this group was to kind of corroborate data with other data to kind of triangulate and see, you know, is this, is, is this table accurate? Does it match with the field, um, et cetera. Okay, next. And then this graph suggests this is another TED's graph measuring ad admits admissions. This suggests that the overall in Hawaii, the number of admits with co-occurring disorders, that's the yes, the green line is hovering, you know, as of 2015, 2017, about 20%. But notice how the green line kind of uh, uh, shows an increasing percentage, suggests an increased percent, an increasing percentage of COD admits, especially for 2018 and 2019, which seems closer to what we're hearing providers are seeing. That is a higher percentage of client admits with co-occurring disorders. All right, um, next slide. So I think we're, that's in a nutshell, some of the highlights that we have for you today. Again, we're trying to be comprehensive, but you know, there's only so much we can do in a short time segment, but please engage with the, uh, click the links that were provided. Um, and uh, we hope to hear from you and sit down with many of you and have a chat. Uh, thank you so much. Dev, back to you. Okay, thank you, John, for that overview. Um, and we are now at our discussion section. We have about, uh, say, 10 or so minutes. Um, and we have some questions pre prepared. Uh, and this one, I think it's open to the, all of the panelists. Um, but I think um, maybe I'll ask Jerry to give some input first. Um, the question is, as subject matter experts, what are some key highlights on the intersection of substance use and mental health that you would like to share with the audience from your own um, experience? Um, you know, again, please, if you are in the audience and you have comments or you have an answer, please add it to the chat as well. Um, but I'll uh, pass it over to Jerry to get us started with the, this first question. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the beautiful job <clears throat> and all the, I know how much hard work has gone into this. And thank you for all the, the uh, providers and participants for their uh, interest today. So uh, the intersection of substance use and mental health can be something as simple as tobacco use disorder and panic disorder or something as severe as schizoaffective disorder or schizophrenia and methamphetamine use, plus other substances, alcohol, tobacco, et cetera. By the way, uh, tobacco is still the number one substance related cause of death for our state and the United States and really the world. 
Uh, last year, there were 1,400 deaths from tobacco, tobacco-related deaths, and there were 140 methamphetamine-related deaths. But you don't see very many people in OCCC who said, hey, I smoked a couple of cigarettes with a friend and we robbed some tourists and got arrested. So methamphetamine is very criminogenic. Uh, so the type of patients that I see um, in the uh, Queen's emergency room and at OCCC are a small subset of very severe and intractable uh, dual disorder cases. Um, a lot of patients are so sick they're not able to present for treatment and we also would need to figure out what to do for all those in a pre-contemplation state for that sort of shadow population of people that are using but that are pre-contemplation. But in any event, uh, anytime you have a combined disorder, and it may be, by the way, there's a, something everyone can join called the World Association on Dual Disorders. I know it has a strange name. It's called WADD, W-A-D-D, -D, World Association on Dual Disorders. But it's an international forum of experts about dual disorders, and they contend the dual disorders are sort of the more common thing than the separate disorders um, that a lot of people with substance use disorders aren't screened and that sort of thing. And then just a couple closing comments because I don't want to drag on and I want the audience and others to give feedback. But that is um, uh, about uh, bias in data. And um, we're facing a very difficult uh, situation. If you look at the DSM-5 criteria for substance use disorder, which we all use, um, a number of the criteria, three of them relate to your job or your home, your marriage or your family relationships or your work or school. And a lot of our uh, patients don't even start with those things. They lost those things a long time ago. So there's and if you look at Ted's data, you'll see that there's a disproportionate representation of people of Hawaiian and uh, other, other uh, and I, I think black, if you look at Ted's data, there's a disproportionate representation of those patients that uh, are homeless or jobless or don't have a family. So statistically, their chances of being diagnosed with a proper level of substance use disorder are different from, from that part of the population where the criteria seem to be designed for a, you know, sort of a more white collar employed person with a family that, that since they specifically represent those things. So we're facing some difficult issues of bias. Um, the second thing is that, you know, while the NUSTA data is, is great and it's what we have, it's a household survey conducted by telephone. And a lot of our patients are on the street or in the hospital or in jail or whatever, and they're not able to get to their phone at the time the survey calls. So they're not able to participate. And with that, I'll, I'll close and pass it back to you, Dev. Thanks for letting me comment. Thank you so much, Jerry, that those were really great insights. Um, we have time, I think, for maybe one or two more discussion questions in the section. Um, so our second discussion question is, how has the COVID-19 pandemic impacted mental health substance use in the state, as well as mental health substance use treatment service delivery? Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, pass this over to either Jared or, or, Jer or Jerry again. Um, you know, maybe you can give us some insights uh, as well for our discussion. Okay, I will go ahead and uh, give my opinion on it and uh, certainly, you know, appreciate uh, Jerry's offering his perspective as well. Um, certainly from the point of view of workforce, I know that's been an area that they've been concerned about with regards to availability of workforce has been one area. I think in terms of how services are delivered in terms of hybrid, um, the idea that prior to the impact of 
COVID, a lot of services had been in-house in a sense uh, taking place. Um, I want to hear Heather's perspective because I know she's done outreach. And so I want Heather to be able to dovetail in to what Jerry and I have been talking about. But I think since then, there's been the recognition that there needs to be a way to connect with others who need services using other means um, through the traditional of just being able to have people show up at particular programs. Heather, I know you do outreach, so I do want to hear you, especially because I know we have limited time and I know you do outreach and I know you've certainly seen the impact of COVID-19. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Yero. So I think to the two things I'd like to comment on um, is one, the impact of COVID on the service delivery, meaning we had, we had less um, shelter beds, we had less treatment beds. So there's more, sometimes more of a wait to get into these services. Uh, but secondarily, our data is indicating, and actually the point in time that just came out yesterday is that there's even more substance use on the streets than we had pre-COVID. Um, so I, th I think you're right. We're, see we're seeing more of that, especially the intersection with more, we're seeing a lot more psychosis, whether that's drug induced or, you know, untreated mental health or a combination, as Dr. Bush said. And I think that, um, again, given how how stretched our service providers are, right? Who never close. Thank you everybody for doing this work because y'all never closed during COVID. We're just really seeing our system stretched. Um, so I really agree with you, Dr. Duro. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Heather and Jared for those comments. Uh, does anyone else in our panel have any inputs to this question? It's it's uh, Jerry. Um, I just agree with uh, what uh, Heather and uh, Jared have, have explained. I think that's a good summary. This is John. Uh, I would one one thing that we will continue to monitor is um, the use of telehealth uh, services. So our current EHR information system has a place and service code, so we can. Uh, look at which encounters are uh, rendered through telehealth and what services are you would use telehealth because telehealth isn't for every service. But I think that's going to be here to stay as a result of the pandemic. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to our panel. Um, and I think we will now move over to the next half of our presentation. We do have two more questions here, uh, two or three more questions that we have, um, which are how does the data presented in the report reflect or differ from what you have experienced while providing services? Uh, what are some trends that you see might be important to consider for future data collection? Um, and those I think our panelists uh, did touch a little bit on. Um, when we get to the end of the webinar, if we do have time, we'll come back to some of those, but those are very similar questions to what we have for our next discussion section. Okay, so now we move on to our second half. As I mentioned, um, we are going to be looking at substance use, intersection of substance use and homelessness. We have our third poll question now, which should be coming up on your screen. Very similar to the, the first question, how familiar are you with the homelessness issues in the state? Again, a few moments to provide your answer. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your response. And again, we have our fourth poll question. Uh, which is very similar to the question number two. Are you directly involved with providing homelessness services? This is a simple yes or no question. Again, I'll give you a few moments. Okay, thank you so much for your responses. Um, We'll now move over to the overview of chapter five. Um, and this chapter is split into two subsections. 
The first section is looking at the overall landscape and intersection between homelessness and substance use, abuse, and dependence. The data sets that we <clears throat> use for this section are the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, Continuum of Care for Homeless Populations and Subpopulations. We also have data from Partners in Care, which is the Oahu Continuum of Care, as we mentioned, uh, as well as from Bridging the Gap, which oversees the Continuum of Care for the other islands. From what I can understand, these three entities are partners, and so while we have compiled the data from technically three different entities, this data is closely related and complementary. One of these sources is the point in time count that is conducted on a regular basis by the respective entities for each jurisdiction. This data is updated frequently, and the most recent year that we have is for 2020. The second section looks at treatment, and again, we have the TED's admission data set, which we already went over in the overview of chapter four. Um, this next slide outlines some of what I just went over, but again, if you want more detailed information about each data set, please refer to the appendix of the report. Um, and now I'll be passing it over to Jared to take us through the highlights of this section. So again, in looking at substance use, abuse, and dependence, this is uh, a graph related to homelessness in the state of Hawaii by living situation, really, uh, for the most recent decade from 2010 to 2020. And this was also from HUD, looking at continuum of care, homeless assistance programs, population and subpopulations report. So if you look at the years and if you look at the count ranging really from zero all the way from 8,000, this gives you an idea of the total looking at those that were sheltered and looking at those that were unsheltered. So as you can see, um, the trend line really starting from 2010, moving up as we start getting into the middle part of the decade and then starting to trend downwards a little bit, but still staying relatively, you know, hovering in the same, in, in a high area. So you look at the top line for the total, still roughly around 6,000, having moved up to 8,000 and then still above the 6,000 level. And you look at the unsheltered total, looking at about 2,000 at the beginning of the decade, moving up 2016 to above 4,000, then dipping below that, but still only slightly below 4,000. And then looking at the shelter total, which is generally hovered a little below 4,000 and then slightly below 3,000 through 2020. Next slide, please. So looking at chronic substance abuse among individuals experiencing homelessness in the state of Hawaii by living situation, and again, also for the same decade. And if we look at 2010, looking at the shelter total, noticing that with count a little bit below 500 and then starting to edge up and trending below 500 and staying relatively steady. On the other hand, if you look at the unshelter total, starting at 500, um, a little after 2012, uh, peaking to about 2016, a little over 1,000, and then the trend line starting to head down, although between 500 to 1,000 around 2020. And yet, if you look at the total overall, 2020, excuse me, 2012, um, going up significantly by the time it's 2016, 1,500 overall. And then by the time we hit 2020, it's over 1,000. Next slide, please. So with regard to treatment admissions in the state of Hawaii by living arrangement from 2015 to 2019, which is really the last half of the previous decade, uh, this is from TEDS or the treatment episode data set. So if we look at uh, number of admissions with regards to homeless, independent living, dependent living, and those are missing, unknown, or not collected or um, invalid. Um, we can see the trend lines again starting or ranging from zero all the way up to 6,000 and higher, but then ultimately all of them starting to move down. So about the time of 2019, but still relatively high. Um, so already we're looking at well above um, 2,000 when we're looking at homeless. We look at the yellow area on top of those who were independent living and those with dependent living. Next slide, please. And then for this slide, we're looking at treatment admissions in the state of Hawaii by primary substance use and living arrangement for 2019. And again, this is all part of TEDS. 
So looking at major substances, uh, you can see where alcohol and methamphetamine are those that really um, stick out incredibly. Uh, another one is you look at marijuana or hashish. And then we also have um, heroin. And so again, with regard to living arrangement, looking at homeless, independent, living dependent, or else those missing and no, not collected or invalid. And next slide, please, which is our discussion. And I will turn it back over to Dev. Thank you so much, uh, Jared, for that uh, overview. Um, and again, if you have any questions or comments, please add it to the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and move over to our discussion question. And again, I'm gonna pass this over to Heather, who is our uh, subject matter expert on the panel. Um, what are some key highlights on the intersection of homelessness and mental health that you would like to share with our audience? Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and be with this great panel for this discussion. So I think looking at the literature, the data, and just being able to work in this field uh, myself for the past 20 years here in Hawaii, the, one of the biggest challenges is the silos between the homeless service system and the substance use continuum of care or the behavioral health continuum of care. I think there's been an incredible amount of synergy um, of bringing those together. Uh, but a great example of how they're disconnected is that um, if you go into treatment for more than 90 days, you actually lose what's called your chronic homelessness status, even if you're homeless, which is then going to make it hard for us to house you when you come out of treatment. Um, uh, there's also, you know, we have WITS for um, substance we have HMIS for homelessness and so they don't talk to each other. Uh, we also have people that are houseless and need treatment. Um, and so people try to put them into residential, but they may not have, that may not be clinically appropriate. Um, but then it's really hard to go to treatment if you're still on the street. So how can we maybe partner therapeutic living communities um, with treatment? So all of the different ways that these two systems intersect or don't intersect, I think really make some of the challenges for those of us that are working with populations that have the overlap. Um, so that was, I think is one of the biggest ones. The other one is really the causation or the cycle around substance use and homelessness, meaning uh, we know people sometimes are homeless because of their substance use, right? So it got so chaotic, they lost their place to live, they maybe lost connection with family to be able to live there, et cetera. Um, and then we've also seen people who were, became houseless maybe because of poverty or not being able to make rent. And then because they're out there, they start to use because they're worried about getting hurt or assaulted or getting their things stolen. And so they start using methamphetamine to stay awake. So that whole kind of intersection of like, is this a substance use causing or perpetuating the homelessness? Is it the homelessness that's leading to substance use? And how do we, again, address both in systems that are relatively separate? So those are two of the major ways that we see that intersection being challenging in Hawaii, but also again, seeing some real progress moving forward. And I think ADAT is um, a very great example of that and seeing how we can better in intersect. For example, we're now seeing homeless providers as part of the substance use continuum of care. Um, and then we're seeing substance use providers as part of the homeless continuum of care, which will lead us to more of that integration. Thank you so much, Heather, for those insights. I definitely have heard, you know, something along these lines um, recurring. It's a recurring theme that we've heard. Um, I'll go over to our next question. Um, and again, this is related to how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted homelessness, substance use in the state, as well as substance use, homelessness services delivery. Uh, I'll pass it back to you, Heather, and see if, um, you know, we can uh, add, uh, other panelists can add um, after. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, you know, I think we're still figuring out exactly how. In fact, just yesterday, the Oahu point in time data was released. Um, and one of the questions was, is your houselessness related to the COVID um, crisis? And while we did have some folks that identified that, um, it was actually a little lower than I would have expected because what we're hearing is that COVID is very much contributed to either people not being able to stay in closed living quarters, um, maybe again, the, um, the shelters and, sh and housing providers have had to put more spaces um, so that there's not transmission. Sometimes they've had to close their doors, um, uh, especially our houseless community are not always the most reliable historians about whether they've been vaccinated um, or things like that, or maybe even adherence to, to masks. So there's been a lot of capacity issues within the, the housing communities, as well as the uh, behavioral health system. 
At the same time, we've had a few, I think, bright spots. I just want to highlight, you know, um, the Behavioral Health Administration really took, uh, during COVID, really stepped out and said, hey, our community is being disproportionately affected. They partnered um, with the homeless community. So, for example, there was the BHH surge, which was behavioral health and homelessness Um Oh my gosh, working group. I'm sorry, I'm not getting the acronym right. Um, but really kind of bringing this together because we were struggling with some of the same issues. And out of that was born TQIC, the Temporary Quarantine and Isolation Center, which was the first time ever that I think we were able to really address both behavioral health needs and the crisis of the pandemic and having a, a place for people who couldn't isolate or quarantine because they were houseless, have a place for them to be. Um, and the white paper that I believe is still on the health department's website really showed that people's behavioral health increased by having these shelter opportunities, even though COVID was the door or how they got in, they left into services and into housing and things like that. And that was really the basis for the stabilization sites that um, AMHD is continuing to do. So um, I think like telehealth and John mentioned, there was a few bright spots in COVID and changes that hopefully we can continue. Um, but overall, um, like one highlight that I saw in the point in time count, and you're gonna, um, you know, looking at the data on the streets is now one third of the unsheltered population on Oahu re reported on March 9th, just a couple months ago, that they were using drugs and other substances enough to impact their daily functioning. That is much higher than the 2020 point in time. And so I think we're just beginning to be able to better understand how much more substance use and mental health we're seeing on our streets. Uh, and again, in the point in time uh, count that just came out yesterday, you can go to partnersincareoahu.org to get that data because it tells you much more than just substance use, but I was really shocked to see a whole third of those on the street a couple of months ago said that they really struggle with substance use. But I'd love to hear um, Dr. Bush's perspective from more of the hospital setting on this intersection if he's open to it. Well, thank you. Uh, the last time I really was involved uh, with directly with the homeless population was when I worked at the H4 clinic, which closed um, in uh, June of 20, 2020, 2020 maybe. Um, but uh, one of the problems that I noticed uh, was sort of a, and I'll give a kind of a clinical example. Um, people would uh, either uh, arrive here or something would happen where they'd lose their home and all of a sudden they were on the street. Um, they would become depressed. And then uh, one of my uh, big things I'm interested in is the person to person transmission of substance use disorder. And uh, I think everybody understands person to person transmission now from, from their the, the uh, health liter literacy we've all gained from the COVID epidemic. But over and over, I'd see people develop methamphetamine use disorder because other people would say, hey, this will help you feel better. So one thing is the spread and the uh, incidence. That's the number of new cases um, per unit of time in, in the uh, homeless community. Uh, and the, the other question is, you know, how do we intervene? Uh, it's a community that uh, is lacking in uh, things like uh, internet or, or digital availability, even though there's great places like Punawai Rest Stop and the many of the other uh, uh, places where people can use those things. But it may be that we, you know, I know we're not talking about interventions, but more sort of either kiosks or things where people can do digital or uh, virtual uh, case management. Uh, you know, at certain points, people sort of deteriorate and they lose their ability to do those things. But there seems to be a disease progression for many people. And there's a lot of different stories and ways people arrive. Um, so that's just one, one example. And uh, thanks, Heather, for asking me for my feedback. I noticed that uh, Jared had his mic on. Yeah, and actually, I have a question for you, Heather. I admit I 
I'm a person who likes to follow economics on the news because I am always aware of, unfortunately, the spillover effects that happens to our, our field. And so when I look at the war in Ukraine and how it affects potentially food prices, when I look at the price of fuel and other things, one of the concerns I have is sort of the, the domino effects or spillover effects with, you know, the cost of housing, you know, the cost of basic supplies like food, infant formula, where we know we've already got a supply chain. I'm wondering if you are seeing differences just in terms of who now is showing up as homeless because of, I'd almost say, a, a multitude of different economic factors um, and well, as well as shortages of just basic commodities that I think are beyond the reach or becoming beyond the reach of certain individuals. Yeah, no, you're really right. Um, you're really right, Jared. I think uh, we're seeing it everywhere since the eviction moratorium ended last uh, last fall. A lot of folks that were hanging on just with some of the extra COVID relief that was coming down from the feds and the states as soon as that ended, um, then the you know they were going they were getting eviction notices. So um, that's been a really significant concern um, is seeing folks that really had that stability um, and no longer do. Um, we're also seeing, as you mentioned, um, we also run um, some food drops with the food bank. Um, and I cannot tell you how much is, is the need increase. We always run out of food distribution. We serve like 300 families at a time. But the folks that are coming have really diversified over the past couple of years. Um, again, not to judge or, or any one of us could be a couple of paychecks away from being houseless or needing to get um, SNAP or food benefits, but really seeing how much um, people rely on things like the food bank. And um, we're so grateful for the Hawaii food bank and all that they provide. So yes, we are very much seeing this. And I I think it's going to be interesting to um, uh, continue to follow up as, as the, um, for lack of a better term, the COVID resources on a federal level start to go away. I'm really worried, Jared, that that was creating almost like a false safety net for these folks that were already on that edge, that when that's gone, um, we're just going to see more and more folks fall into houselessness, as well as the increase in behavioral health challenges, right? Because it's scary to lose your job or to lose your housing or to have all, get, get an eviction notice and all of the things that go along um, with these challenges. And, and I would echo that, Heather. My concern are the economic ones because we may have cyclical with regards to COVID or other pandemic related situations that happens. My concern is if I'm looking at the economic forecasts and they're talking about a bear market, we could be looking at a sustained period where there's gonna be huge economic impact and just what the stresses are um, for not only those existing who are houseless, but even those potentially who may become houseless and what the pressures that are gonna be for mental health and substance use disorder services. I mean, you named it, Jared. One of the ironies of some of both of our systems is sometimes you have to be in real trouble before you can get the help you need. So a great example is we don't have a lot of prevention or what's called diversion services for homelessness. So you, you get an eviction notice, there's a little bit we can do. Um, but you know, there's not a lot of other programs that are targeted to provide prevention and diversion. But once you're on the street, especially once you've been on the street for a year, oh, then I can help you. My program can help you, but not until then. Um, and so I agree with you that, that that's really going to be, uh, we're going to see a lot of folks that, that don't necessarily know how to navigate a very complex system um, all of a sudden have to navigate and, it's, um, and, and our system is not set up for it. Uh, we don't have, as I mentioned, these abilities to help divert or prevent homelessness are very few. Um, and it's very sad that we almost have to wait for folks to, to be on the street before we're able to help them. So I'm right where you are. And even if we increase our minimum wage, um, which is, I think, where we may be the state to have the highest in the country, it's not going to even be close to mitigate the cost of, you know, the food. A lot of our houseless are in cars. So the, the, the cost of gas and other pieces, as you mentioned, are very important. So, oh yeah, our Alice families are going to continue to struggle, Jared. And how do we try to prevent that when our system is more of a response and not a prevention? Yeah. Thank you, Heather. I, <laughs> and I know you've been in this a long time, so I know you see it and I know you can label it. <laughs> Thank you guys for this great discussion. I'm um, looking at the time we have maybe one, we had some time for maybe one more um, question. Um, and I know Heather, you've already kind of touched on this in some of your previous answers, but maybe if you can, um, 
you know, elaborate on our question here. What are some trends that you yeah. might, might be considered for future data collection? No, I'm actually really grateful that you asked this asked this question. So one of the biggest things that we're asking kind of non-homeless um, service providers is, is to make sure to really collect housing status. So there are some systems that don't do a great job of collecting housing status, and then it makes it really hard for us to see how many people. So thank you, ADAD, for collecting housing status in your treatment data. So we want to see that. So for example, um, Queens, where Dr. Bush works, um, they the Queens Care Coalition and, and other folks there, in fact, in the point in time report, this year we actually have a whole page on who was houseless at queens the same night that we counted it's the first time we've ever done that because queens is prioritized getting housing status so they could also better track who was coming to queens that's houseless and how can we better integrate our services so please the more that folks can collect housing status in your existing data the better that we can cross collaborate um, and then i think the other one um, is to get some of these um uh geographical nuances um you know, looking at, again, the point in time report shows you how the West side is different with substance use and their homeless population than downtown Chinatown. Um, so really being able to do kind of targeted, at least street-based targeted work. Um, and then I guess lastly is looking at housing first. So I did look at, J at Jared's data and what changed in 2016. I don't think that's the only reason it's responsible for the doubt. That's when housing first got to Hawaii. And we started actually housing people before we mandated treatment and then kind of wrapped around the services of treatment once they're housed. But we haven't done a great job of looking at people once they're housed with substance use disorder or mental health. How, what does that success look like? Are they able to find the path to recovery? And then what do we need to do to maintain housing? So those are some of the data points that I think we can continue to work on. Thank you so much, Heather, for those insights. Those those were great. I learned a lot today. And I'm sure our uh, participants and our audience learned a lot as well. Thank you to all our um, our panelists. Um, so, you know, I, again, I'm conscious of time. Um, we're really at the end of our webinar, but before we let you go. We wanted to remind you of our upcoming webinars. Uh, our next one is on uh, the third of next month, and that will be looking at uh, substance use and criminal justice and substance use and juvenile justice. Um, please do consider signing up for these if you haven't. Uh, we're going to be sharing the link to the registration in the chat again. You'll also find the links um, and all this information on the Hawaii Behavior Half dashboard. Uh, again, here is our contact information we're going to be providing in the slides, which will be coming out. Um, and the links are here as well. And also our post webinar survey. Um, please, you know, we're finishing slightly early, take a minute or two to sign uh, to, to fill out our, our webinar survey. It'll make it, you know, the future webinars uh, better. We hope that we did, you know, a good job today. Um, if you think so, please let us know. If we didn't, then let us uh, know as well. That would be great. Um, okay. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for joining us. Um, mahalo, and I hope that you all have a great uh, rest of your Friday and weekend. Aloha.